Last talk on the last day. Thanks to everybody for <laughs> staying awake and staying in the room. Um, this was originally going to be John Tanaka's presentation. He's the director for the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management, and he sends his apologies. He's in the process of hiring a new accountant, which I'm pretty sure we're probably having more fun than he is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Cindy Gerritsen Wibble, when I get to the end section of the presentation, part of it deals with business planning, and those are her slides, her area of expertise, but she was able to collaborate with the round table on a project, and so I wanna be sure to give her credit for all of her hard work. Um, so I'm gonna kinda do three sections here a rapid shotgun overview of everything the Roundtable has done during their 12-year history, and then some examples of the assessment indicators, because that's really where the Roundtable started. Um, and then to comply with the curriculum-based focus here, I'll get into an application uh, with a sustainable ranch management guidebook. That's what the exhibit over there talks about as well. That was, um, among our projects, the most curriculum-friendly of the bunch. So the Roundtable is a partnership process. Uh, we started 12 years ago. Um, some of you may have heard about the Montreal process for forest sustainability. Um, international agreements, much more complex than what we did with rangeland, but that was the impetus to start this effort. It's been an open door policy. Anyone who wanted to participate, no matter what their background or interest, was able to do so. And so we've had more than 100 participants um, from more than 50 organizations at different times scientists, land managers, ranchers, environmentalists, policy experts, some lawyers, the full spectrum. Um, this is probably a little redundant at this point in the meeting, but we took the uh, three-legged stool approach when we began this effort. So social, economic, and ecological sustainability um, with the goals shifting as societies needs and desires shift, but with all three always present um, in our projects. So the mission that the roundtable undertook was um, three parts. We started with development of criterion indicators with the goal being national assessment of rangeland resources. Um, and then moving on from that, once we developed the indicators, we focused on widespread use and a dialogue on sustainability, which has actually been one of the more interesting parts of the project. Now we focus in four areas. Um, we work with advocacy and promotion. So one of the handouts we have over there is a rangeland issues forum. We partnered with eight other groups, um, producer organizations like the American Sheep Industry Ga Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative, Soil and Water Conservation um, Society, and Society, let's see, um, National Association of Conservation Districts. Anyway, a list of partners to go up to Congress and talk about issues. What are the things that are really threatening rangelands today? So we had a speaker on energy development and the trade-offs that you need to keep in mind. We talked a little bit about <coughs> food security and also production agriculture. Integrated rangeland assessment remains a strong goal for us. Uh, we were able to get the Natural Resource Conservation Service through their National Resource Inventory and the Forest Service through their Forest Inventory and Analysis to partner on a pilot project up in Oregon to see if they could get data out of their two national monitoring platforms and get those systems to talk to each other. And they began that effort in 2007. That report is gonna come out hopefully before the end of the calendar year. But it was quite an effort, um, kind of like bringing two battleships alongside and so the exciting part of that will be the next steps. Now they know they can do it, but do they want to do it? Um, integrated rangeland research, so bringing together projects that aren't just ecological or just economic, um, pulling in all the pieces, a lot of ecosystem services oriented things. And then um, communication and coordination. We've done meetings and conferences, briefings, um, scientific posters, and tried to coordinate with as many other rangeland sustainability efforts as we could cross paths with. Um, in a timeline context, this is sort of where we've been and what we've done, a little bit on where we're going here. Um, working forward from the indicators, looking at an implementation workshop, getting into ecosystem services, which we saw as the most logical bridge between the ecological and the social and economic. Um, 
we have a publication on a conceptual framework that explains that in boxes and arrows. So it's not a mathematical model. It's a whole lot of boxes and arrows that go through various time steps to kind of show the things that you would think about. Um, the framework was first published in the Journal of Society and Natural Resources. And then jumping forward um, to looking at energy resources, we used the model there as well to do a theoretical evaluation of the trade-offs you need to consider. So for folks who like the boxes and arrows, those publications are out there. Um, we're getting into climate change and food security. What we figured out about our indicators is that they're not that exciting. I mean, in and of themselves, they're just data. And so if you can't attach them to an issue people care about, they're never gonna live and breathe. Um, so we have publications coming out on climate change. We've done some um, work on food security that's been in conference proceedings, and we'll expand on that as well. We'll hopefully get a um, peer-reviewed journal article out on the climate change work as well. And then something else we're diving into here is a social and economic survey of public lands ranchers. The ranching industry, so National Cattlemen's Beef Association and Public Lands Council, as well as the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management want to get more into this ecosystem services kind of idea. They want to know not only what are the costs that these producers pay in addition to their permit fee to manage this land, but what are the benefits that come from that? Having these folks out there in terms of different goods and services benefits society and they feel like there needs to be a more comprehensive effort to communicate that. So the original task was indicators, um, social, ecological, and economic at multiple scales, and respect for all the participants was important throughout the process. We never asked anyone to leave a meeting, but people had to have conversations kind of in the back of the room and be reminded that their perspective was not the only one that mattered. Uh, when I talk about criteria, they're just general statements, um, conditions or processes that are more goals, and then the indicators are the things that you can actually measure. So the criteria the roundtable came up with mirror the Montreal process criteria. If anyone's familiar with those, they had seven, we went with five. But soil and water, plants and animals, um, productive capacity, social and economic benefits, and then legal, institutional, and economic frameworks we found that the last set of indicators tended to be more qualitative. It was really hard to get at that in a quantifiable way. Um, some examples of the indicators in looking at soil and water, bare ground is one of the ones that was identified as being really important. Um, and it highlights some of the difficulties in not having a standardized national database, um, using remote sensing, but there's difficulties there as well. And then we talked earlier today about invertebrate databases. Um, one here at Utah State University was identified as an important indicator. And then Storet um, is a database for water quality that EPA maintains. Um, productive capacity, this is a figure that the Heinz Center used in their report. Um, the work was done by one of the scientists we worked with as well. But just looking at the numbers of domestic livestock on rangelands, um, Social and economic indicators in the original set were more than half of what people identified as important things to measure. This one just looks at the value of forage harvested from rangeland by livestock. And um, this is something you know that matters regionally and nationally, but it's something that the producer on the ground would also be interested in. So that's one of the indicators that we were able to translate from national level work down to our ranch level work. Um, some other things, like riparian condition, we switched up and we went with a green line method when we looked at things that you could talk about at a ranch level. So the ranch sustainability guidebook that I mentioned earlier is on the jump drives for everybody. Um, the components that we included were public lands applications, that were contributed by authors from Forest Service and BLM, private lands applications in terms of conservation planning and conservation program qualification that were written by folks with the NRCS, and then rangeland monitoring circling back to the indicators. 
And then business planning and succession, the pieces that the Wyoming Business Council contributed for us. And then some information on pulling that all together into a sustainability assessment. Um, I mentioned Cindy earlier, for anybody looking for information on business planning, as a SARE project, she did a binder that's about this thick, sustaining uh, Western rural livelihoods, landscapes, and a third one I'm forgetting. But um, that's on our website, and I think the Business Council has that probably <coughs> on their website as well. So Cindy talks about overcoming the challenges um, to ensure sustainability of agriculture, so dealing with profitability or the lack of that, um, land conversion to other uses, and an aging population. Cindy believes, and we agree, that a business plan is a great way for producers to evaluate their options. So some of the choices that they have are keeping things the same, making minor changes, major changes, or diversifying and adding an entirely different enterprise. And um, doing that in the context of a business plan gives producers a structured way to consider uh, the costs and benefits, pros and cons of all that. So Cindy's definition of a, a business plan is just a communication tool to enhance your success and ensure your survival. And she makes the point that in this environment, dealing with bankers and other sources of funding, um, a business plan is a really good way to show you're serious. So the components of a business plan that she lays out in her planning process, um, market analysis, market plan, identifying the management team, getting at the financial plan, and then doing a break-even analysis to make sure that you're gonna get where you think you're going. Um, other aspects that are important are looking at the personal and family values. And um, when she does workshops on this, she has a role play component, so you really get to see the dynamics among the different family members. And then um, the resource inventory, which is kind of the monitoring that the round table is interested in. And then a SWOT analysis, so the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this is probably true in business planning and many other things. If you don't know where you're going, you're probably gonna end up someplace else. One of Cindy's favorite quotes. And then I'll just close with an example. We worked with a rancher actually down in Texas on this to see if the process was gonna be as useful as we thought it was. And this is a guy who's in his 60s. His ranch has won environmental stewardship awards. So he didn't have a lot of management problems going into the process. Um, but he began the monitoring right before the big droughts came into Texas in 2011. And because his ranch was in such good condition, he didn't really see an impact until 2012 from the drought. And he was able to adjust, reduce his stocking rate, and he was so excited to have them come back out and collect the data this year in 2013 and see that he was so close to being back to the expected production on his sites. And he was more excited about his ability to use that information than we were. You know, we were kind of like, well, yeah, it's monitoring data. You know, you had NRCS come out and set this all up. He's like, no, but look, we're almost, I mean, so excited, which was very exciting for all of us too. Um, so just his interpretations of the data here. And the takeaway was just that good resource management made his ranch more sustainable. And this was taking, you know, like I said, an award-winning ranch and making it even better. So. That was exciting for him and exciting for us too. Um, I'm happy to talk more offline about our other work with climate change or food security, um, the energy development stuff, any and all of it. I know this was a whole lot super quick. Um, and if any of this really resonated with someone and you're thinking, wow, why am I not involved in that? I wanna be. Um, we have a meeting coming up in early December, the fourth through the sixth in Las Vegas, and it's still an open door policy Y'all come and we'll probably be dealing with the same array of um, projects and programs I talked about here. Thanks. <laughs>